The Bain Free Radio Hour. On the podcast, genomics, space homics, and yo homies, dark matter and the light fantastic. Plus, we continue with the complete audiobook serialization of David Drake's The Sea Without a Shore. All right now. Welcome to the Bain Free Radio Hour podcast. It's an honor to have you along. I'm Bain editor Tony Daniel. It's time we talk with Eric Flint and Reich E. Spohr about their new entry in the Boundary series, Castaway Odyssey. This is book five in the Boundary series and a sequel to Castaway Planet, which started a sort of second sub-series within the Boundary series universe. We'll learn more about this cool, hard science fiction novel in a moment. And we also continue with the complete audiobook serialization of The Sea Without a Shore by David Drake. Now here's the news. Hey, there is new free fiction and nonfiction up on the Bain.com homepage. Those of you in the know and on the ball know that once a month we get kind of out of hand and go over the top to deliver you a cool essay usually science or military related or something like that, based and often relating to an upcoming book out from Bain. And we offer monthly free fiction, which is usually set in the world of a book that will appear the following month at booksellers. We ask the writers to explore a side character or storyline of their novel if they want, and to give you a taste of the world to explore. We've had some really great stories come out of that. This month for nonfiction, we have Dark Matter of the Human Genome by Dan Kobold. This is a very interesting piece on the parts of the human genome that, uh, well, we simply don't know what it is they do or, does, or don't do. There are some intriguing hints and interesting ideas on this genetic dark matter that are out there, and genetic scientist and science fiction writer Dan Kobold explores some of these in the piece. It's really fascinating. For our October free fiction, we have Space Home by Michael Z. Williamson. This is a story set in his Freehold science fiction universe, and it is a story that takes place just before the next entry in the Freehold series, which is Angel Eyes. That will be out in November. Space Home has some interesting political and military maneuvering underway as a, an economically failing space station and independent state out on the edge of our solar system gets caught in the rising tensions as the UN of Earth and the forces of the libertarian planet of grain prepare for a war that's been brewing for a generation. Dark Matter of the Human Genome and Space Home by Michael Z. Williamson are both available on the front page at Bain.com. After November 15th, they'll be available in ebook form in two ebooks. Free Nonfiction 2016 and Free Short Stories 2016. Both of these are found in the Bain Free Library at Bain eBooks. So check them out. I want to welcome Eric Flint and Reich E. Spohr to the podcast. Hello, guys. Eric Flint is a modern master of alternate history fiction with over 3 million books in print and science fiction, by the way. He's the author or creator of the uh, New York Times bestselling Ring of Fire series. David Drake, he's written six popular novels in the Belisarius alternate Roman history series. And with David Weber, collaborated on 1633 and 1634, the Baltic War, among other things. He's the author or co-author of many, many more books and series as well. Eric was, we'll talk about one of those momentarily. Eric was a labor union activist for many years as well. Reiki Spohr is the author of many Bane books, including Digital Night, its transfiguration into Paradigms Lost, the Arenaverse novels, Grand Central Arena, Spheres of Influence, and Upcoming Challenges of the Deeps. Reich is also the creator of Epic Fantasy The Balanced Sword series, with entries Phoenix Rising, Phoenix in Shadow, and Phoenix Ascendant. He's the author of the Polychrome series, which is a kind of adult reworking of L. Frank Baum's Oz. And with Eric Flint, he is the co-author of the hard science fiction Boundary series, including Boundary, Threshold, Portal, then jumping ahead a few years in the series' time frame to Castaway Planet, and now, at booksellers everywhere, Castaway Odyssey. 
So in Castaway Planet, we meet the uh, Kimai family, uh, I think that's how you say it, who has uh, crash-landed on the planet Lincoln. They've been part of the crew of the Starship Outward Initiative when something happened. And this moment of something happening to Outward Initiative is also the starting point for Castaway Odyssey, I think. What happened uh, aboard the Outward Initiative that was bad? Where are we when the book starts, in other words? Well, when the book starts, you're, they're in trans colony that they're supposed to all be colonists of. Quite all of them. I mean, there's proof for the Outward Initiative, but most of them are colonists. And they're about halfway or so to their destination when, well, the something that happens, they don't really figure out except until the, uh, the, the story disaster, which is, um, put up for the, uh, previous, uh, um, for for Castaway Planet. That's on Bain.com. And now it's in the uh, free short fiction, is it 2015? Yeah, it would have been whenever Castaway yeah. Planet the came free out. short fiction, 2015 ebook. Basically, they found out that uh, the, for various reasons, the field that generates their faster than a light drive uh, suffered instability. And so it caused part of it to be going faster than light and part of it not. And the part not, of course, got torn off and left behind. Fortunately for our uh, heroes, there was, in fact, a life drill on at the time this disaster happens. So when they get separated, they're actually in a lifeboat. Otherwise, it could have been far worse for everyone concerned. Why were they in the lifeboat? Were they just running a drill, or was it um, as a response to this thing that goes wrong? Nope, they were just doing a routine drill, and fortunately for them, they were all sealed up in the capsule when the accident happened. Um, and uh, the finding out why it happened required an entire re- a, uh, that entire story is them sort of is the other people investigating once they find out that our initiative was lost hmm. and how it was. Yeah. So, in Castaway Planet, we learn the fate of the Kimais. Um, Kimay, actually. Kimays, Kimays. Um, May. Their alien friends, uh, friend Whips, um, who we've met in, uh, I, I believe, in Threshold Boundary. Portal. Portal. The third. Uh, Portal was when we first met up the, with the alien race, yeah. So, it seems to be the luck of the draw who is in what lifeboat, but... Um, we are concerned in Castaway Odyssey with the LS-88. There are two adults, and the rest are youngsters. The youngest is only eight. Um, can we start with, uh, can we talk about some of the characters? Uh, maybe start with Francisco. Um, who are our castaways? I mean, each of them has various nascent uh, talents that they get to develop during the, the course of the novel as they encounter problems, right? That's right. Francisco is the youngest, and in some ways he deals with it. Yeah, Francisco Coronel is is his last name. He's actually separated from his parents, as his parents were elsewhere in the ship when the drill was sounded, and you have to go to the nearest. This makes him very dependent on the other people, um, not just because he's young, but because he he now has to look to other people as his emotional support, um, as a substitute parental figures. He is um, more artistic than the others. Most of the other people are, in one way or another, technically inclined. He's artistic, but also very good at observation and um, seeing details that others might miss. And that's the, the the talent that he brings, and that has some use during the uh, uh, during their adventures. So, what about the others? Uh, what uh, is it, Xavier? Now, next up is Maddox, if we're doing youngest uh, youngest to oldest. Yes. Um, Maddox is really good with tools, and he is good at figuring out how to make their you know, fairly high-tech tool set do more than people think it can do. How old is Maddox in the, in the novel? Um, I believe I said he's 14. Mm-hmm. Uh, yeah, that's around there. Yep. And uh, he is just starting his more advanced education. So he's not an engineer, but he does have a very technological mindset. He's very cheerful, very, 
very willing to please. Well, uh, Francisco tends to be a bit more moody. Uh, the next up would be Tavana Aranax. Tavana is from uh, French Polynesia, and um, yeah, he's from French Polynesian. He's French Polynesian ancestry. Um, he's sixteen. Um, physically, he is he's like a brick. He, he's only five foot five, but he is pretty massive and extremely strong. So this is one thing that, outside of his tech- technical skill. Uh, serves him very well during their uh, sudden change from being shipboard passengers to being unwilling castaways. He has uh, he, he is basically a geek at heart, despite the strength. He'd rather stay indoors than out. But once you force him outdoors, he's actually quite proficient at doing things. Zinderbird is uh, Maddox's older brother. He is uh, quite tall. He's 6'3". Um, and uh, bit. Um, he is a structural engineer, which gives him a lot of um, vital knowledge for building things, but not quite so much for repairing a ship, which unfortunately turns out to be one of the first things to do. Um, but he is very mature for his age, which is 19. Um, and is one of the people that helps hold the whole group of them. Yeah. Xander's kind of, I mean, he's the leader of the kids, right? I mean, as far as... Yeah, he'd be the one that's that they look at as their uh, as the boss of their group, but not the boss of the whole crew, because that, of course, is the sergeant himself. Yeah. Um, so we have two adults. Uh, we have... Uh, well, at first, at least. We have the redoubtable Sergeant Samuel Morgan Campbell. Um, tell, he's a really capable guy. Tell us a little about him. He's a winning character. He is. Being, well, he is a, uh, the biggest person in the crew. He's, he's three inches taller than Xander. Built like, a, built like a wall, and he is in top physical condition. He is actually Chief Master Sergeant. He's been in the uh, service of the uh, Marines for the Colonial Security Forces for about 20 years, maybe a little more. And um, he's seen pretty much everything, done pretty much everything. He's a pilot, is one of his major things, but he's also an expert combatant and survivalist. If he wasn't on board, it would have been a total disaster, but he's able to take command and... Uh, deal with many of the situations that the kids wouldn't have been able to, even if they had the technical expertise to do so. He's sometimes intimidating, but he tries not to be. The sort of arc of the story is is, is Campbell leading them to take more and more leadership and, and initiative themselves, right, as they get more confident in themselves. Yes, uh, partly because he does not want them absolutely relying on him because in this kind of situation, something could happen to him. Mm-hmm. So it's desperately important that there be backups. Um, and relatively early on, I think about halfway through the book, he actually ends up putting Xander in technical command, even though Xander is like, what the hell are you doing? But, but he's trying to do that because it's his job to make sure they survive, even if he doesn't. So he has to make sure that they're all ready. And the other adult along for the ride, literally along for the ride at first, is Lieutenant Pierce Haley. Um, and she's a friend of Campbell's, a, possibly a, a love interest, right? At least according to the kids. And what is she doing outside the, the craft? <laughs> Maybe we can get into the story at this point. <laughs> well, what she's doing outside is she was just leaving the craft because she was inspecting them to make sure that the was going properly. Um, and the accident happens just as she has sealed the airlock behind her, but before she has left the area of the airlock. So she is literally in the boarding tube just outside the ship when it happens. And uh, thus she goes with the ship stuck to the outside in the boarding tube. Um, rather fortunate in one sense and very unfortunate in another. 
so there's this life craft tumbling out the LS-88, uh, tumbling through space. There's radiation damage, and um, Pierce has, has gotten um, severe radiation exposure. And, and there's something, that, the part she's attached to, I mean, it's, I mean it's, it's not really a spoiler. We need to set up the book. Um, how do Campbell and the kids go about dealing with this situation, and Pierce also? Well, the first thing that happens is they realize that none of the controls are responding on LS-88 at all. And after a short period of investigation between Ander, Campbell, and uh, Vanna. How did the characters come about? Um, they Did you all discuss them? Were they um, some one authors and some the other, or are they all just one person's? The specific characters were chosen by Ray. He developed them. The background is this. The first book, uh, Cast Away uh, Planet, modeled that quite closely in some respects on um, the, you know, the old classic book, Swiss Family Robinson. Just as the Swiss Family Robinson was the family unit, so were the committees. The only thing it did was they switched the genders. In the original Swiss Family Robinson, it was a husband and wife and their four sons. We made a husband and wife and four daughters. Uh, if you look at the four daughters, they, to some degree in temperament, match the four boys in Swiss Family Robinson, for instance. Okay. Swiss Family Robinson ends, well, there are several different versions of Swiss Family Robinson, but the best known one ends with the family discovering uh, it's a bottle washes up with a note in it on their island, uh, that's from another castaway, a young woman who has uh, been shipwrecked and is, is marooned on a different island not too far away from theirs. And at the end of the book, they build a boat and they're set off to go rescue her. And insofar as there's any specific inspiration, not so much for the characters, but for the scenario, what we thought we'd do in the second book would be as if, kind of loosely, we were completing the second book of Sir Stanley Robinson Saga. Now, the main difference, if you look at the at the characters in Castaway Odyssey, is they are not a family unit. Um, in fact, they're except for two brothers, Maddox and I can. Right, what's the older one's name? I can't remember. Xander. Yeah, Xander. They're brothers, but all the other people are unrelated to each other. Uh, so it's not at all like the like the first book where it's a very tightly knit family unit. You know, this is something quite different. Uh, so that's how the basic idea got started. The specific characters Reich developed. Well, after Reich did the first, I looked. I liked the character, so you know we just went with them from there. But that is the big difference between the two novels. Is um, it's not the only difference, but it's one of them. Is that the character, the sets of characters are quite different. Yeah. The, um, I mean, part of the, the story of the, the book is how these disparate kids and, and Sergeant Campbell come together as, as a sort of functioning, if not family, uh, you know, a, a close unit that's able to uh, deal with situations that arise. Yeah, and to an extent, uh, that's, part of that was also inspired by one of the other classics of, of, uh, of castaway fiction, which is Mysterious Island by Jules Verne. There you had a whole bunch of people who were, for the most part, not related, cast up on uh, on this island and forced to figure out how to survive on their own and eventually bond into what amounts to a family unit, even though they are not related. Yeah, they, we are sort of cribbing from, uh, well, not so much Robinson Crusoe, but... Um, both Rick and I are big fans of, of Jules Verne's Mysterious Island. And what we did switch around was that in the original Swiss Family Robinson, the family lands in the island. They've got a ton of stuff because that yeah. the ship, that the shipwrecks keep basically dumping stuff on the beach. So they are very, very well equipped. We, we switched that around in Castaway Planet because we had an accident happen almost right away. So they lose their ship. They lose almost everything. And, that's uh, and in that respect, they are much closer to the situation of the castaways in 
in Byrne's novel who start basically with a pocket watch, and that's about it. Um, and, you know, what, they're, what clothes they're wearing. Um, what we did in the second book is the, the, the character unit is not a family unit, they're disparate, but they actually have a lot more stuff. A lot more of their stuff survives the landing. Um, and they're actually the ones that do the, uh, the, the, the voyage across the sea to find the, uh, the other set of castaways, not, not the way it was in, uh, so, you know, when I say Swiss Family Robinson is our model, um, we took plenty of liberties with it, and there's quite a bit of Jules Verne's in there also. And we also had the, deliberately had the, wrote up the second crew, I deliberately mirrored skill sets as well. So, both sides have particular sets of skills that the others lack, so that you can have contrasting approaches to the same problems. So what are some of the problems um, that, that they face, uh, especially initially? They're in a bad, uh, bad shape. They don't have any control over the craft when, when Pierce is, uh, is initially on there, uh, Lieutenant Pierce, who's outside. No. No, they don't, because it's tripped to safety that prevents people from doing things like firing the rockets when you're still stuck to the side of the ship. It thinks that it's still stuck to the side of the ship because the boarding tube is still locked to it. And so the only solution they can think of to that is to detach the boarding tube. Well, the problem with that is that Pierce Haley is still in the tube, and without uh, the and with all the controls mostly down and the power damaged and everything, they can't even open the airlock to bring her in. Well, but Fortunately, they're, fortunately, she and Campbell are both military, which means that they both have military nanotech implants, basically medical nanobots in their in their systems. Um, the kids have them, but they're civilian issue, not military. But because Pierce and Campbell both have military ones using similar protocols, um, Campbell is able to reprogram hers with what amounts to a field suspension. And you can put her into what amounts to a cold sleep. So, and that's necessary both because they're going to leave her in interstellar space, right. and she's had this huge radiation dose, right? Right. Without it, without it, she's going to die in a relatively short period of time in a very, very nasty way. Radiation deaths are not pleasant. So, by doing this. He accomplishes two things. One, keeps her alive long enough that hopefully they can fix the ship and then come back to find her once they've done that. And second, make sure she's still alive so that maybe they can figure out some way of curing her. Um, in theory, it's possible. They don't have medical knowledge, but if they can you know, pick her back up and then bring her to a planet that has good medical tech, then they can, you know, have her treated and hopefully saved. So Pierce, you know, you know, Pierce detaches the the the, the tube, um, giving them some control over the vessel, and then puts herself in suspension according to the directions that Campbell gave her. Even that does not solve their problem, since it turns out that while now they can do a little bit of maneuvering, it's only with a bit of a couple of the jets. But the rest of it isn't working. Just seeing them systematically figure out how to write this damaged craft, that's a, a lot of the fun of the of the first part of the novel. What are some of the skills that they that the kids develop, and what are some of the problems they have to overcome? Well, they well the first problem they have to overcome is panic. I mean, while Xander is pretty cool about it, um, and Tavana is semi-okay. The others really start to get kind of freaked about it, as you'd expect. Here they're stranded in a, in a black, non-functioning device where all they've got is some emergency lights and pretty much not anything else. Then the problems they have to figure out are first make sure that the life support systems are running. Then once they can breathe easy on that, literally, they have to figure out how they can, why things aren't working and how they can get them up. So they have to uh, take on the role of starship engineers when they're not really trained to be that. 
and sort of cobble it together from the data that they can get out of their uh, hand-carried data banks, their omnis, and from what each one of them knows. So, Tavana, so for example, Tavana can figure out, oh, this is how I can get the um, system to start processing air again and give us, you know, fresh air. But my tool won't let me do these things, and so that's when Maddox is Maddox demonstrates that he understands um, the complex tools they have better, and is able to show him how he can override the normal limitations and get the tool to do what he needs it to do. Um, then they have to restart the reactor that runs the whole thing, and then they have to figure out how to navigate. Except that it turns out that the radiation pulse also damaged their faster than light drive, so they have to repair that and so on. That was, um, by the way, I I I don't know. It, it was affecting to <laughs> to read about how they rewound rewound the coils. Because I've had to rewind a, an alternator coil, and it's just tedious beyond measure, and you have to get it exactly right. I could just picture it um, as they tried to repair that thing. Things like that, too, and I didn't know how many of my readers would, but I knew the readers that had done something like that would understand exactly what the problem was. Yeah. Yes, it's that. that's one of the most hideous jobs they have. Well, it's really cool the, the way it, the, that they come together. Um, and, and over, I mean, none of their parents are there. Um, and they don't know what's happened, right? Um, no. Yeah. They, they don't, they, they don't have any faster than light communication. So the only way that they find out anything is if a ship gets there to tell them. So no, none of the parents are there and nobody knows. And for the most part, they're going to get most of the news that will travel will say, well, they disappeared. The, the ship had this accident and they're presumed dead. So this is a massive coming of age story for all of these kids, even our uh, our young eight year old. Yeah, uh, that's really part of the point of the <coughs> kind of things you put people in in a pressure cooker, and you see how they react to it. Of course, um, both Eric and I, you know, especially me, but to an extent certainly Eric, tend to like to have main characters that you sympathize with. So we try to make them not turn into massive jerks along the way instead. Uh. Although. A lot of the time you'll see somebody act poorly, react poorly to some circumstance, but they always get back on track. You know. I got the feeling that um, that y'all enjoyed making the problems worse, <laughs> like making them suffer more. It's that. Yeah, I mean, it's kind of the essence <laughs> of a novel like this. I mean, you know, it's... I mean, this is, this is you know, a novel in which there are no villains, um, you know, no weapon is fired or used in anger or any other way. It's just purely a story of people against the elements. And yeah, yeah. <laughs> kind of the secret of that is you pile one problem on top of another one. Uh, because, you know, you don't have villains to do that for you. And <clears throat> what the, I was... When I, before I became published, I did belong to a writer's group. And, you know, I got various feedback from them, but the one that was most important that stuck with me all the time now that I've written it, and many other writers have given the same advice in different ways, but it was given to me by a gentleman named Chuck Rothman, who has had a few novels published himself. And he said, right, the problem is... You have to remember one rule, and that rule is never make it easy on your characters. And as Eric says, you know, especially in this kind of thing, making more trouble is the only way that you can keep driving the plot. You know, if they've solved all their problems, hey, you're you're done. <laughs> well, in the um, all right, in the if they can survive this first part of the. Uh, of the book, and it's a bit of a spoiler, yes, but um, they not exactly unexpected to say that they do manage to make it after much travail. Um, they crash land on a very odd planet. Um, what are some of its characteristics? Um, it, what about the life forms they encounter, for instance? Well, that's one of the first clues as to just how strange the world they're on is. Um, they have things, you know, they, they land and things at first look 
fairly Earth-like. I mean, oh, they've Campbell especially has been to many different planets. But the funny thing is, they has things that look like plants, except they're not quite plants. They they have little tendrils that come out of them, and they look almost like some of the things you see underwater, you know, like hydroids and things like that. And they notice that an awful lot of the creatures seem to be amphibious. They they sh in the previous book you've seen some other characteristics, but the uh, in this one they don't get to see some of the other ones that would be kind of dead giveaways right away. Um, they don't discover the the secret which you and I know, which I think you're about to talk about. <laughs> really makes this a different world. Yeah, the continents. Um, and the land, it's its not land as we know it. Um, no. It's floating coral, basically, that incorporates uh, basically carbon nanotube structure naturally into its structure so it can be strong enough. But basically it's, a, it's like coral. There actually is floating coral on Earth that's been seen, and, and uh, this concept was based partly on that. Based on Eric, uh, Eric wanted this to be a, a water world, and so that was what we came up with for, well, how can we then have places for people to set down when, they're, uh, when they get shipwrecked? Because you can't actually have land on uh, something that has a, a, a ocean that's tens of miles or hundreds of miles deep. The, the land can't support itself. Why did you want it to be a water world, Eric? Because it's different. Uh, it, well, but more specifically, I had been reading, um, this is actually a relatively recent development in uh, astronomy, which is, you know, we now have a much, much better understanding of what kind of planets are, beyond, are out there, you know, not just in our solar system but elsewhere. And one of the things that's emerged which sort of surprised people is that what looks to be much more common, actually, than our kind, than our Earth, are what they call super Earths, and they're not gas giants. They're not that big. Uh, they're rocky planets like ours are, but they're larger. They were from one and a half to four or five times larger, and this can produce all kinds of interesting effects. One of them, obviously, gravity is going to be stronger, but on the other hand, partly depending on on the density and so on and so forth, the, the gravity might not actually be that different from what we experience. But one possibility that emerges, and I'd read an article on it, was the emergence of real water worlds. Not worlds like ours where, you know, water covers about two-thirds of the Earth's surface. But, you know, if you look at the, the, the deepest part of the ocean is about seven miles deep, and the tallest or highest part of land surface about five miles deep. That's really a very minor difference. In fact, if the Earth were shrunk down to the size of a billiard ball, it would actually be smoother than a billiard ball. That's how little real difference there is. It seems really big to us, of course, because of our own size. But the thing about water worlds is you're talking about miles. I mean, not just seven miles. You're talking about 100 miles of water. And so, it just seemed like an interesting challenge. How would you develop, well, you could develop life, but it's a little hard to write a novel where everything is in the water. I mean, where everything is marine. Um, so you want some kind of landforms, land formations. And so, Rick and I discuss this a, a considerable length about what to do and what the the idea we, we did think there might you know very few places be seamounts kind of like the uh, hot spot that created the uh, uh, the Hawaiian Isles so there might actually be a very few parts of this world where where land does rise up actually from the seafloor and, and reach the surface come very close but for the most part over time we figured what would evolve would be these these floating land masses that are islands and None of them are quite the size of continents, but these islands can get pretty damn big, especially because they'll run into each other and, and, and you know, get meld together. So we just started working out the uh, sort of what some of the logical implications would be, what the evolution might be, and what other things you'd get emerging from that. Both, basically, I just want to do it because they're different. 
So it sounds like that you and Reich figured out the world, the setting, and then Reich did a lot of the uh, initial draft, and then uh, y'all got back together and uh, and banged it out. Is that accurate? That's quite accurate, yeah. and he also did by far the most of the writing. I, I would Reich and I have now done a lot of books together. Number one is in now Reich, we're up five, six, and yeah. With each succeeding book, he does more and more of the writing. <laughs> I'm starting to feel guilty about it, actually. In the very first book we did together, Boundary, he wrote the majority of it, but I wrote a lot of it. And, it was about 60-40. Uh, 60-40, roughly, yeah. And then I would do quite a bit of rewriting also. And then it sort of shrunk down the next book, which was Threshold, and then the next book, Portal. And with, with these two books, it's really much... Reich writes at least 90, what would we say, Reich, 95% of it, I would figure. Probably. Um, you did one chapter in each, I think. Yeah, something like, like that. that. And then I'll tweak a lot of stuff. I'll tweak yeah. a lot of stuff, and I'll do some policy and this, that, and the other thing. But mostly my input into these books is, is at the beginning. It's it's figuring them all out. And then periodically, Reich, you know, call me out. We talk through issues that come up. He want to get some feedback on um, do some, or sometimes you'll do some editorial stuff where I'll send you something. You'll say, "Right, that doesn't work." Yeah, and here's yeah, no, no, that's true. That's true. Yeah, yeah, that's true. That's true. That's true. Especially but, when um, my melodrama takes over. <laughs> <laughs> well, you got to understand. If you look at the books that Reich writes on his own, they tend to be a lot more. Uh, I won't call them melodramatic. Let me call them the good old. German phrase Sturm und Drang, which means storm and thunder. Uh, th- whereas the ones he and I do together are very much hard SF, and they're very. I think of them as my Arthur C. Clarke novels. And what I mean by that is, actually, we've done what five books together, and only one yeah, of them is zero. Six we count diamonds. And six we count diamonds. Yeah. Um, and in the second book in the Boundary Trilogy, there is a real couple of villains. And, you know, and there is actually some military action. But for the most part, what happens to these novels is just space exploration, space adventures. And just as true with most Hein uh, Clark novels, also true a lot of Heinlein novels. Um, you know, it's just people confronting very dangerous situations that you would confront once you venture past the planet Earth. And, and coping with it. Um, and it, it, it's not the kind of way that Reich would normally write on his own. <laughs> it's not the kind of story he would prefer on his own. Um, so so I'm, I'm, very grateful, well. I'm very grateful to you for making me do these. <laughs> not, not just monetarily, although certainly monetarily it's been fine, but uh, it's. I would be. Te- I was terrified at the thought of doing them when you first suggested it. But at the same time, I knew if I didn't try it, I'd really hate myself for not trying it. And uh, they are very different, but they've taught me a lot about writing. And you're Yeah, no, that's true, that's true, that's true, that's true. The novel ends with the possibility for, um, for Castaway Planet and Castaway Odyssey to uh, sort of come together. Are we going to see more of our various castaways in future novels, or is this it? Well, we have a contract for more novels, but um, I, Reich and I think we're going to conclude this as we did the Boundary books as a trilogy. Now, you never know. It may be once we actually write it, we'll decide. Like, our original plan with Boundary was to do four books, but then once we got to portal and start working on it, we realize now let's just close it at three. I think that's where we're going to wind up. There'll definitely be a third book in the castaway sequence. There has to be. Um, readers would be very unhappy if we left the word as now. Um, yeah. The other thing uh, is that if we did, it would at least be more feasible to do another book if we wanted to with castaway. If for no other reason than that these people aren't all getting toward their 50s and 60s and, and they're 200 <laughs> years further on and they can live they can live longer too in this era but in cast in the the boundary books I mean they're really some of them were getting on in years and they it just didn't make sense for them to keep gallivanting around the solar system but 
the main characters from Castaway books could, in theory, keep going for quite a while. They've got they're young and they still yeah. Have no, I I remember one of the things that caught up with Reich and I doing the boundary books. The, the boundary books, the science in it is really good and it's really hard. But one one aspect of that is we depict. We don't spend much time on the pages depicting it because it bore people to death. <laughs> but this kind of space travel into the, to the outer planets takes years. I mean, you know, so the the, the time that passes in those three books, About you don't quite, years. Yeah, right, exactly. You don't quite feel it reading them because we tend to skip over really fast. And now they spend a year in space and we'll just, you know, catch up with them as they're approaching the next planet. But... Uh, is it 13 years total, right? Is that what you... What yep, you I, I went over thing? it from start to finish. It's about 13 years. 13 years. And one of the characters, uh, Helen, when we first meet her, is a, in her early 40s. Am I right, Reich? Um I think she was actually... She was, she was on... She was in 40s, yeah. She she was... Yeah, in her 40s. So now think about you know, mid-50s mid by now. And... You know, it's a good health and all the rest of it, but yeah, it, it, after a while, it. And uh, I mean, I'm I'm minded of. I, I was a big fan, still am. I said, read them well of, of uh, Rex Stout's famous Near Wolf and Archie Goodwin novels, but um, <laughs> so am I. They, they span it. about fifty years, and Archie Goodwin never ages. <laughs> well, it's actually <laughs> mentioned in yeah. the books. One of the characters from one of his early, early. Uh, um, cases shows up in like the 60s, 30 or maybe even the 70s, like 30, 40 years afterward, and it's remarked on like, geez, you guys haven't changed a bit since I met you, <laughs> and this guy's now becoming this old man. Well, it must be the effects of uh, of always staying in an orchid greenhouse or whatever it is Nero does. Actually, I think that he's a Highlander, you know, one of the immortals from Highlander. Yeah. Well, so just Nero will, yeah. yanking this big sword up saying, there can be only one! Well, too. Yeah, I know. So, um... Hi, the most ex go ahead. extreme case I know were the uh, Matt Helm books by uh, Donald Hamilton, where the first book, Death of a Citizen, takes place very soon after World War II. And the hero is getting close to 40. And those books go on and on. I think the last ones were written somewhere in the 90s. Certainly the late 80s. And, you know, I mean, he's by now got to be pushing 90. And, but, you know, he seems exactly the same all the way through. Anyway. So we were not going to do that with these books because they're hard SF. So for that reason, after a while, we decided, well, let's, Boundary works nicely as a trilogy. I think that's what we're going to wind up doing in the Castaway books is close them as a trilogy, although we we'll don't know for sure till we write the third one. Yeah, well, it's a lot of fun till now. Um, so I want to ask you both what you're working on at present. Reich, I know one of your projects is a book I'm really looking forward to, Cool and Weird Idea. How is Princess Holiara coming along? Well, I'm getting close to the end of that one now. Let's see, as you know, it's the it's the attempt to write a magical girl novel, what, the, what anime calls the maho shoujo genre, and try to mix it up a bit to really uh, examine some of the tropes and concepts that are associated with that genre and then turn them on their heads here and there, while at the same time playing it relatively straight in other areas. Um, it's getting really close. I should be hopefully turning that into you, actually, in the next month or so. It's good, because i, I got to get on the next Castaway novel. <laughs> the other novel that me and Eric were talking about. Excellent. I look forward to talking about Princess. I it, it just is a weird ass concept, and I really want to want to see what you do with it. Uh, what are, what are you working on at present, Eric? Book it. <laughs> uh, the book I am working on right now is called Iron Angels, and it is a uh, um, it's kind of a cross between a urban fantasy with some definite aspects of horror to it and a police procedural and uh, my co-author is an FBI agent so it's got a lot of it's an FBI procedural more specifically um, 
And it takes place right where I live in the real world, my hometown of East Chicago. Um, so I've never done an urban fantasy before, and I wanted to do one. So um, that's what I'm working on right now. Um, I'm working on the final draft right now. It's the rough draft's already been done. Um, and I'm, there's some chapters i got to write, and there's some stuff i got to rewrite, and so on and so forth. But I'm hoping to have that finished and turned in by roughly a month from now. Cool. And we have coming out in, uh, I believe it's December, uh, the uh, the next Solo Ring of Fire book, which is um, a big a, a turning point of sorts in the series, right? Yeah, well, that's coming out in January. It's called January. 36, The Ottoman Onslaught. Ottoman Onslaught. I've got a ton of books coming. Yeah, I've got a ton of books coming out next year. It's kind of freaky. I've got Ottoman Onslaughts coming out in January. Um, and then the next Ring of Fire book is 1636, Mission of the Mughals, which I wrote with Griff Barber. That's coming out in April. And then it seems to flip back and forth between March and May, so I'm not really sure which month is coming out, but I did a novel with Mike Redman called The Gods of Sagittarius. That's coming out sometime in the spring of next year. And then I've done another author history that's that's not part of the Ring of Fire series, but is connected to it in the same way Time Spike is, called The Alexander Inheritance. It's a book I did with um, Gorkoff and Paul Goodluck, with whom I've written several books before. And then I'll have later on Iron Angels coming out probably in the early fall of next year. And then at the very end of the year, there'll be yet another 1630 uh, Ring of Fire series book called 1636 The Vatican Sanction. So it's going to be a very, very full year for me. Um, and the only one of those novels that I haven't quite finished yet is uh, Iron Angels. That's why I'm working on that right now. Cool. Well, we're looking forward to all of these, uh, but the book that's out right now is Castaway Odyssey by Eric Flint and Reiki Spore. This is book five in the Boundary series and book two in the Castaway sub-series, I guess. It's now available at booksellers everywhere. Eric and Reich, thank you very much for being with us. Oh, our pleasure. All right. Thank you very much. Now we continue with our complete audiobook serialization of David Drake's The Sea Without a Shore. It seems Cinnabar's chief spymaster is a mother also, and her son is determined to search for treasure in the midst of a civil war. Who better to hold the boy's hand and to take the blows directed at him than Captain Daniel Leary, the Republic of Cinnabar Navy's troubleshooter, and his friend the cyberspy Adele Mundy, the only thing certain in the struggle for control of the mining planet Corsera is that the rival parties are more dangerous to their own allies than to their opponents. Daniel and Adele face kidnappers, pirates, and a death squad even before they can get to the real business of ending the war on Corsera and bringing their charge home, maybe along with ancient alien treasure. Now here is the next entry of David Drake's The Sea Without a Shore. As I said, Graves replied, I'm an engineer. Whether or not I like a situation has nothing to do with whether your description of it is accurate. In this case, however, there's more to the matter than there would have been in similar cases. Cleveland nodded. The assault on Hablinger, he said. To Adele, he added. Twelve of our community were killed and the other organizations lost many more. Graves nodded also, but he said, It wasn't just the losses. The Pantelarians underestimated us, the independence movement. But in turn, we underestimated them. We'd driven them back into Haplinger by sheer numbers and enthusiasm. He grimaced at the final word. The Council believed that we should use our momentum and sweep the Pantelarians off the planet, or into the sea if they didn't board their ships quickly enough. Graves spread his hands and looked at Adele. There were probably 10,000 Corsairans under arms at that time, he said. Most of them weren't in any real organization, and they were armed with odds and ends, or not even armed, but 10,000. I'm a member of the council. 
While I don't know that anyone would have taken notice if I'd opposed the assault, I was strongly in favor also. The war itself was evil, and this was the quickest and therefore best means of ending it. I wasn't there, Cleveland said. I was to be part of the third transformationist contingent. The survivors were withdrawn at once and replaced early by the second contingent. The Pantelarians had used their ships. This information was part of the files which Mistress Sand's office had sent to Adele. She listened now without comment. The impression she got from those who had spoken to the victims at the time had a vividness which third-party reports could not provide. We assumed the destroyers were merely escorts for the transports, Graves said. Instead, it was a trap. They were hoping to wipe out resistance in one stroke, and they very nearly managed to do so. The ships came over at low level using their plasma cannon. They slaughtered over a thousand of us. There was no cover. We were attacking over the rice paddies. I didn't think you could fire ship's guns in an atmosphere, Cleveland said, shaking his head. I thought the guns blew up if you tried. It erodes the bores of plasma cannon badly, Adele said, and the range is short. But they don't blow up, no. Daniel frequently used his plasma cannon against ground targets, and he taught his crews to do so as well. That meant the certain replacement of the thick, stubby iridium cannon barrels after every use. But in a battle, everything, certainly including the cost of hardware, was second to winning. For some reason, the Pantelarians didn't counterattack then, Graves said. We were able to regroup. Independence troops couldn't run away through the paddies any more easily than the Pantelarians could attack, Cleveland said, smiling faintly. Otherwise, I'm sure no one would have stayed in the lines around Hablinger. Certainly, I wouldn't have stayed if I'd been there and had the choice. Yes, Graves said. The only proper highways in the Delta are the two on top of the levees to either side of the river. Near Hablinger, the bed of the Cephasis is nearly 30 feet above the paddies. Getting onto the roads quickly would be impossible. And it would have been suicide with the destroyers strafing. But I'm still surprised they didn't counterattack. I doubt Governor Arnaud deliberately drew you into a trap, Adele said. She was reporting Daniel's analysis of the file data, but she could have come to the same conclusion herself. She had gained experience of wars and with irregular troops in the years since she had met Daniel. I suspect the expeditionary force reacted in desperation. Using warships in that fashion is very dangerous, even if the captain is skilled in atmosphere maneuvers. Few of them are. She smiled with a cold pride of a sissy, a member of the crew of the Princess Cecile, whose captain was an exceptional ship handler and whose example had drawn his officers to emulation. There might be Pantelarian officers whose skills rose to the level of an average RCN officer, but Adele would not believe without proof that any of them could equal what Daniel and Vesey had accomplished more than once in her experience. The naval officers might have been willing to abandon the troops, Adele continued aloud. They certainly would have been willing to leave the infantry in the mud, in her opinion. But the destroyers wouldn't have been able to actually make space voyages without several days of preparation, or more. They probably attacked you half crude as it was. Nothing less than a crisis would have forced the commanders to risk their ships as they did. Graves looked as though she had just dumped ice water over him. You mean that if we'd given them a chance to escape, he said, speaking with great care, they wouldn't have slaughtered us? Adele grimaced. I don't know what would have happened, she said. There are too many variables. I'm reasonably sure that without the spur of necessity, Pantelarian naval officers wouldn't have been willing to risk their ships in a low-level attack of that nature. A lucky impeller slug could have shattered several thruster nozzles. A clumsy ship handler would have crashed when his thrust was suddenly unbalanced. She was uncomfortable with the discussion. The past was information. That was her life, or would be her life in a perfect universe. The future was prediction. That was part of her present duty as an RCN officer, guiding the actions of her fellows, her family. Speculation on what would have happened if some factor had been different was a third thing, a pointless and foolish thing so far as Adele was concerned. Changing one aspect of a past complex situation could not change the present, Nothing could change the present, and the side effects of that single change were beyond what Adele's intelligence could determine with any degree of certainty. 
She smiled coldly at Graves. There may be humans better able to calculate those side effects than I am, but I haven't met them yet. Aloud, Adele said, consciously changing the subject. Then the disaster at Haplinger caused the coalition to fracture. Graves nodded, looking relieved to leave the subject. Adele wasn't sure what happened to her face when she was angry. She had thought that her expression simply went blank, but the reactions of other people suggested that there was more going on than that. The casualties were stressful, certainly, Graves said. But all the parties had agreed on the attack, and the casualties were fairly evenly spread also. Most of the dead were minors, Cleveland said. Men, mostly men, who weren't members of any of the groups. They'd been treating the whole business as a big bar fight until the destroyers swept over. After that, most of the survivors went home as quickly as they could, though we still outnumbered the Pantelarians around Haplinger. It was clear that we couldn't simply assault the Pantelarian lines again, Graves said. We couldn't have gotten any of the troops to obey that order. Someone suggested in the council meeting, I think it was Mistress Tibbs, that we buy anti-ship missiles and place them in the front lines. Both she and Captain Simona hoped to be able to acquire missiles from Alliance sources, but they weren't able to do so. Adele nodded crisply. If the Alliance, or even one well-placed Alliance bureaucrat, decided to risk breaking the Treaty of Amiens, either out of peak at Pantelleria, or simply to earn some under-the-table cash, there was a good chance of rekindling a war that would destroy civilization. We found the Republic of Karst was willing to deal with us, Graves said. Kars isn't allied with either Cinnabar or the Alliance, so its only concern is with the reaction of Pantelleria itself. It didn't seem terribly worried about that, but it wanted considerable trade concessions from Corsera for its help. I see, said Adele. She concealed her frown behind a bland face. Adele and Daniel had personal experience of Karst, an independent regional power of considerable significance. When the old headman, dictator had died, his nephew and successor had taken Karst from being a strong Cinnabar ally into the Alliance camp. For a matter of weeks, until RCN forces under Captain Daniel Leary had destroyed the Alliance fleet in the region. The young headman had been assassinated almost immediately, and Karst had retreated to neutrality under her new leaders. The Treaty of Amiens had followed quickly, leaving Karst a pariah, trusted by neither superpower, but too strong to be punished without more effort that either Cinnabar or the Alliance wanted to expend. Karst had lost much of its trade in the aftermath of the war. Gaining a monopoly on Corsair and Copper would cause, not quite force, other powers to resume dealing with Karst, and thus to pave a road out of the diplomatic wilderness for her. The problem was deciding who would go to Kars to negotiate, Graves said. The three major independence factions all suspected the others would use the negotiations to gain supreme power for themselves after the Pantelarians were driven out. He smiled faintly. I suspected that too, he said. But I believed that the rival parties would keep one another honest without my personal involvement. Adele nodded without looking up. Graves was showing himself intelligent and pragmatic. In any case, Graves said, the council sent a three-person delegation to Karst with full authority to negotiate the deal. The exile faction sent their seconds in command, but Colonel Bourbon of the garrison went himself. Bourbon had been commanding all council field forces at the Hablinger front, while his deputy, Major Murciello, forwarded supplies and dealt with council matters. Graves shrugged. I didn't have a high opinion of Murciello, he said but he had handled his duties well enough, as best as I could tell. The delegation hired a transport and lifted for Karst four months ago. Two months ago, a messenger from Colonel Bourbon said there was an agreement in principle and that the delegation would be returning shortly. That was just before I left for Cinnabar, Cleveland said. I thought, well, I hoped that the fighting would be over before I returned. Many of us had our hopes up, Graves said with a sigh. A week after the messenger's arrival, a ship from Ischia arrived with a message for the council signed by all three delegates, saying that they had been captured by Ischian pirates who were holding them for ransom. And that is where the business rests at present. How much is the ransom, Adele said. None of this information had been in the files from Mistress Sand. Graves opened his hands. It's trade concessions, he said, much like the demands by Karst. 
Though, of course, Ischia can't offer missiles, and simply getting the delegates back wouldn't end the war. I admit I agree with Colonel, as he now calls himself, Murciello, who takes that position very strongly. Did Murciello engineer the kidnapping? Adele asked. She had her data unit on the deck. Her wands quivered as she made a further search of the main garrison database, looking for hidden or closed files which might have escaped the initial cull that her equipment had made from orbit. I don't think that Murciello has the intelligence or the imagination to plan such a coup, Graves said. The Ischians have had their own problems since the Treaty of Amiens, and this is very much the sort of thing they might have come up with themselves. He frowned and pursed his lips before continuing. I very much doubt that Murciello wants his predecessor back, however. And I'm not sure that he wants the war to end until he's consolidated power on Corsera in his own hands. He's moved his headquarters into the Gulkander Palace on the plaza, and it's rumored that he's gathering troops in the neighborhood of Brotherhood, though he's not moving additional forces into the city. I can check on troop movements, Adele thought. In fact, she probably had the information already. The locations hadn't meant anything to her without context, however. The palace? Cleveland said in surprise. What do they do with the collections? Graves shook his head. I hope they're being stored, he said. But Murciello has the culture and spiritual enlightenment of a barroom swamper. I suppose we have more immediate concerns than what happens to books and antiques. What collections are these, Adele said. Worrying about objects in the midst of a war in which human beings were being killed in large numbers would seem perverse to most people. However, if one believed, as Adele did, that nothing whatever mattered in the long term, then all things mattered equally. She smiled in her mind, but her face remained still. Arn Gulkinder, a Pantellerian governor of the past century, Graves said, was a great collector of books, art, furniture. He built a real palace on the plaza. Perhaps you noticed it as you came here. It's just a few doors down. Yes, said Adele. She reminded herself to keep her eyes on Graves. She was being polite, because he was answering a question for her personally. Gulkander loved Brotherhood and retired here with his family, Graves said. His descendants have lived here ever since, though they weren't of any political significance. They fled to Pantelleria at the Declaration of Independence, because that's where their investments are. Murciello would have ousted them as quickly as he did their caretaker, I'm sure. I see, said Adele, standing. Thank you, Brother Graves. I have a much better understanding of the situation than documents alone had given me. The two men rose also. It's been a pleasure, mistress, Graves said, offering his hand. Cleveland said, We're trying to preserve our community in difficult circumstances. By helping us, I truly believe that you're helping humanity in at least a small degree. Clearing his throat, he added, I'll remain with Brother Graves for a moment, if you don't mind. Adele turned. Tovera had already opened the door. Tovera and I can find our way back to the ship, Adele said. But before we do that, I'm going to visit the Galkander Palace. That was another entry in our complete audiobook serialization of The Sea Without a Shore by David Drake. And that's it for the podcast. Thanks to Audible.com and to podcast theme composer Ruth Judkowitz. Anna Huzza in an alien tongue that lacks recursion. And so it goes on and on and on and on and on until everyone on the planet has shouted approval and praise for Eric Flint and Reiki Spore, co-authors of Castaway Odyssey. Please join us next time here at the hammering heart of science fiction and fantasy. And keep reaching for the stars. Thank you.